Hi there, and welcome to Flip the Script Season 2, Episode 3, How to Continue Prospecting During COVID Without Coming Off Icky. My name is Beck Collin. I'm the CEO and founder of Flip the Script. Before we jump in, if you go ahead and do me a small favor, download the deck that's on the side of this session so we can follow along at each step of the way. Once you've done that, let's go ahead and jump into the content. There are 10 different steps to selling without the ick during COVID. So let's start with step number one. Step number one is be personalized and relevant to them in specific. So I would argue that you should do this all the time. Actually, I have argued that you should do this all the time. But if COVID's the thing that gets everyone going, that's great news. So I would, what I mean by personalization is not just personalizing down to the firmographic setup in terms of the company vertical or the demographic setup in terms of their buyer persona role or the uh, technographic setup in terms of what tech stack they're using but you want to go to them in specific. So the difference between personalization and relevance, personalization means something you can send to one person in specific. Relevance means it's something that you could segment users based on. So there's a difference there of something that you could send to one individual. So in terms of selling without the X during COVID, you wanna make sure that you of course always know by default what their buyer persona cares about, you know, what their industry cares about, et cetera. But you also want to make sure that you know what care what they what matters to that person in specific by something that they wrote, something that they said, engage with, etc. If you want to know more about personalization, go to personalization at scale in the core sessions. I believe it's core session four. But you get the gist of so this is a way to default uh, diffuse your user or diffuse your buyer from uh, thinking that you don't know who they are. So it takes away that icky syndrome of, oh, okay, I'm, this person's selling into me. Number two, understand their new reality and adjust accordingly. So I'm gonna give you an example. We've all had a lot of different buyer persona value props in the past. And when COVID hit, things changed. Things changed for people in a very, very drastic way. Some industries, you know, did really well, like Zoom, you know, for instance, a web conferencing software. It was a, a really, really, from a fiscal perspective, you know, um, event that triggered a lot of business that came into them. And some industries, it emptied out their pocketbook essentially overnight. And so your buyers, regardless of what industry or regardless of what role, their new reality has changed, period. And so the amount that you can shift as a company, the amount it, that you can be agile and basically pivot your new value prop is going to be the amount that you can really make sense to this buyer in their new normal. So instead of just taking all your old value props and rehashing them and being like, oh, okay, we're going to make this slight tweak, you want to build from the ground up. So I do a session, uh, full disclosure, in this uh, season where I talk about uh, navigating your way to a new elevator pitch. I believe that session, uh, episode six in season two. So if you want to know more, go to that session. But basically an example here is whenever COVID hit, I was working for a conversation intelligence software and we normally were talking about all how we can make your sellers close better. We can identify best practices, et cetera. We went from making your closers better to how they could sell remotely better. Some of that was best in practice. Some of that was by increasing accountability or cross collaboration or coaching in a remote environment. But TLDR, one of the smartest things or best things that I did for my team is reevaluate everything in the new light right off the bat so I can make sure that I can really speak in terms of granularity to the buyer and their new normal. At uh, number three, um, I would let get, go of past pains and solve for the present. So things that mattered to someone and were a very, very big pain in the past are not a pain necessarily now. And I'll give you kind of a low hanging fruit example. It might be a, an off analogy, but you'll get the gist. You know, someone who had a lot of pain with pr uh, printing out things in the office, you know, with that printer of like, okay, very um, office space style of, you know, they want to beat the printer up in the field because of how bad it is or the copy up in the field. Now they don't have a printer, they're at home. So maybe they bought a printer, maybe they didn't, but TLDR, like it's a completely different world. So maybe a bad exa example, but you get the gist. You need to let go of what your buyer was dealing with and not hold on to the fact that that necessarily is what matters to them anymore. So I would rethink what your buyer is running into now in this new environment, you know, couple low hanging fruit, collaboration is really tough, accountability is really tough. You know, learning how to pivot to a digital age is really tough. You know, events turning into virtual events, but you need to let go of what your buyer was running into and know that there might be some similarities, but there's probably quite a few differences between what they're running into now. So I'd evaluate, again, I do a session on this, I believe it's episode six, 
on evaluating your buyer personas, their new headaches, and how you can pivot your elevator pitch. But you need to get used to the fact that there, the pains of the past, the pains pre-COVID, may or may not be the current pains, and you need to solve for the current pains in their day-to-day. Uh, number four, uh, how you can avoid selling uh, with the icks and giving your prospect the icks is don't lead with the language that everyone's leading with. <laughs> Might sound insane, but everyone's leading with hope you're staying safe or uncertain times or, you know, the new reality and et cetera. So you don't want to right off the bat lead with saying, hope you and your kids are staying safe with everything going or, you know, during COVID. Everyone's doing that from all of the outreach that I've received recently is everyone's talking about it in the first line. So what happens is um, when someone reads, Google did a study on how you read outreach and you start at two o'clock and work your way clockwise. So basically what it communicates to you is people wanna know who you are in the first line and what you want in the last line before they read about your value prop. So your most valuable real estate from a sequential perspective is the end of your first line. So if you are burning that line on not only something that's not specific to them, you know, in specific of like, I saw you wrote this article or I saw you said this thing, you're not only missing an opportunity to prove to them that you have researched them, but number two is you are triggering pattern recognition in their head. So salespeople all lead with about the same type of thing. Just want to check in, just want to bubble up this to the top of your inbox, just want to follow up, just want to duck my head back in here. Happy Monday you know, hope whatever, like if it's near a holiday, hope you had a good holiday season, hope you're having a great new year, hope you're having a good start to Q3. We're all leading with the same generic thing. So when it came to COVID, a lot of people I'd see, they'd start leading with like, hope you're staying safe, you know, in these uncertain times. And, you know, number one, again, you're wasting the valuable real estate where you can prove to them that you know who they are in specific. But number two, you're triggering pattern recognition at this, in their head so that if you act like a typical seller, they're going to start treating you like a typical seller. So they're just going to, best case scenario, delete and move on. Uh, and then the last one uh, is on number five. If you want to sell a, oh, if you do sell a COVID-friendly product, I wouldn't lead with that. There are a number of businesses, like I mentioned Zoom, that actually the pandemic was advantageous for. So great example of that is Charmin toilet paper (laughs) or, you know, whoever is. uh, Uncle Ben, like he he saw a massive like uptick in his stock. And so it's okay that the pandemic worked to the favor of some businesses. What is not okay is if you are trumpeting that right off the bat and seeming to have no you know remorse about what's going on. So. It's a bummer either way. This is a very, very uh, global scale tragedy that's going on. And so instead of leading with like, hey, actually, you know, in this new environment, blah, 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 this is advantageous to us, you, you'll get to that, right? People will know that Zoom is something that they should be buying. People will know that in this new, when they have to pivot all the education system to going remote, that there's going to be a certain amount of products that they didn't have before that all of a sudden they really need. But instead of going, I've seen a lot of companies going like the fear selling angle right off the bat. You know, they're like telling people like, hey, because of COVID, you should be buying this thing. And like, I get that the intent's there and I get that it is advantageous to some sellers, but you want to be very, very cognizant of like, this is again, a global tragedy that is happening on a scale that we have not, I've certainly not seen in my lifetime. And so instead of talking about how awesome your product is and all the things that people can do with your product during this, you know, everything going on, you want to lead with them and have a touch of self-awareness in this process. So number six on how to sell without having the X uh, to your prospect is um, if possible, I would pull out, if it were me, I would pull out severely affected industries. So there's a number of severely affected industries and I give a couple of examples here. Recruiting businesses, community workspaces, you know, like real estate, commercial real estate is taking quite a big hit right now. And so if you are selling into some of these businesses, I understand that in some cases, so I never give some specific, um, you know, diagnosis to someone that I don't know. Like if you're watching this video, I don't know your world. Okay. So it's safe to say, unless you're my mom, (laughs) in that case, hi, mom, 
Everyone else, I don't really know your world or what product you're selling or who you're selling into or how you've been affected by this pandemic. However, I would say it's a good rule of thumb if you can afford the luxury to not sell into WeWork, for instance, right now, I would pull them out of your book of business. I mean, this is just a preference thing and this is just the human in me coming out. But when we're talking about recruiting businesses, like they're having to scale down quite a bit right now because there's more candidates on the market than ever before. So people don't, you know, like they can see a lot more candidates right now. And so recruiting businesses have taken a massive hit. I know a friend of mine who is a CEO of a great recruiting company and all of a sudden overnight, like she had to do massive layoffs and she had to, you know, pull out of a couple of different industries. So if you can, and again, if you don't have the luxury of doing that, if selling to a recruiting business is in between you and bankruptcy, like, well, you got to do what you got to do, right? You're in the same situation. But if you do have the luxury, and most of us do, of selling into a TAM that's above, you know, 100 companies, and you can sell into other different companies that aren't community workspaces, I would suggest doing so. So, you know, my last company, like we sold into a lot of different companies. And yes, we could sell into recruiting companies during the pandemic. And yes, we could sell into community workspaces. But I suggested to my team, and by suggested, I mean I pulled them out entirely, <laughs> all of the companies that were really taking a hit during COVID, and you just want to be there during that time and make sure that you can be as helpful as you can to make sure everybody's afloat. Uh, number seven, using the push-pull method in COVID emails. So if you want to know more about what the push-pull is, if you go to Silver Bullet Central uh, session number one, um, or I also cover it in season one, but the push-pull method is a way to balance your outreach by telling your prospect that either way, whether they give you what you want or not, you are there for them and you really value them and you hope that they're you know, doing okay. So this is a good place as an alternate to right off the bat saying like, hope you and your kids are staying safe during this time and causing pattern recognition. If you go to the last line right, right after you ask for what you want in your CTA or call to action, the push pull, you can intertwine something like either way, I hope, you know, big fan of your your team and I hope you're staying safe and sane with everything going on in the world. So if you don't mention COVID, people think you're insensitive. If you do mention COVID right off the bat and how advantageous it is for your company, they think you're monetizing a pandemic. So you want to sit right there in between where you're saying like, hey, I realize that this, you know, you're thinking in your head, I realize this is going on. Let's not talk about that for a second. I saw you wrote this article. It's great. Here's a line that I really liked. Here's how, you know, I think it could hook to my product. You give me a shot on Wednesday at two to talk about that. You know, I promise I, I won't uh, hammer you with follow-up if you're not impressed. Either way, such a big fan of your team. Keep the good articles coming and hope you're staying safe and sane with everything going on, the, uh, on in the world. So great place to intertwine COVID language so they know that you're self-aware and you realize that there is a huge pandemic that has hit, but also you don't cause pattern recognition at the beginning of your email. Uh, number eight, understand their new buying process. This is a great one. Sorry, I keep like falling in love with the points as I see them. Uh, understanding their new buying process. Even the buying process has changed for our prospects during COVID. I'll give you a great example. CFOs are more involved than ever before. Beforehand, of course, CFOs are kind of the final approval because they're overlooking any kind of purchases, spend, et cetera. But during the pandemic, out of fear, people started pulling back, you know, purchases and, uh, purchasing and budgets. So they said like, okay, we're going to put a freeze on anything that is not an absolute necessary have to have during this time because we just don't know. We don't know how long the pandemic's gonna happen. We don't know how long that we're gonna be working remotely. We don't know how long this is going to be happening to us. And so a lot of CFOs that I know have been pulling back not only budgets, but they have been very, very granular about the purchasing decisions of the other adjoining departments. So understand your new, not only that your new buyer is in a completely different world, but understand that their buying process has even shifted. So they're having to be under more scrutiny than ever before. They're having to um, include others more than ever before to understand if this is you know, cross-departmental uh, cross unilaterally, a great decision for our company. So I would go so far as to, with these three steps, for instance, in the CFO, you know, create collateral that speaks to the CFO in terms of your company. You want to get ahead of it for your buyer. 
you want to enable your buyer that if they do want to buy this software, uh, software, that you help them and you're their advocate of like, how do we sell into this CFO who I may or may not talk to that often. So I create collateral that um, communicates to the CFO, you know, what happens to the overall revenue or the overall, you know, ROI of the software in their terms and language. Uh, kind of a quick tip. Usually if you study the disk profile, uh, CFOs are typically high C, meaning they really like details and they really like justify, uh, justifiable, logical data to make a decision. And they typically, if you don't give them that data, then they're gonna dig their heels in even, in even further and not trust you. So you wanna make sure that you're very pragmatic, logical, detail-oriented, and data-driven whenever you're talking to a CFO, typically. It's a mass generalization, but it's just what I've seen. Um, I would outline, uh, outline expected steps for a multi-thread, even for my buyer of saying, hey, you know, like, it's great that you want to buy this. Tip Let me tell you what I've typically seen. You know, during COVID, and it makes sense, there are several different stakeholders who are involved, usually including the CFO. Um, may I make a suggestion? Typically, the next step, you know, after if you do think that there's value after this meeting, that we could set a meeting with them, you know, if you could get 30 minutes on their calendar, you can send them over this collateral as a bait, and we could cover X, Y, and Z to see if it's a good, you know, good decision to move forward. So you need to tell your buyer, like what the normal process is and really lead them along in the buying process and not just not leave it up to them but put the onus of them figuring that out on themselves. Because not only is it a pain in the butt to them, but it also can affect your outcome. But really, we want, we want to be focused with enabling our buyer from the onset, whether that's in the purchasing decisions or whether that's in um, you know, figuring out if this is a fit for their team with expected steps and what we normally see with being open to that being uh, different and unique in several different cases, but still having a standard. Um, I would also uh, think through how a CFO would see this purchase. So I'm not saying that luxury goods can't be bought in this economy, they certainly can, but I would put on my CFO cap and say, when I'm looking at a purchase like this, what would I be thinking? I would be thinking through, if I were a CFO, how would I see this purchase? And like, would I see the ROI? Would I see this as a frills buy? If it was a frills buy, what was the strategy behind it? Like, for example, you know, I want to treat my team really well, you know, so that we can build up culture and keep them coming back and we can build up cross team collaboration. The thrills buy or frills buy is not necessarily, you know, not a um, not something that we can do right now. But you need to tie you need to put on the CFO cap and say, what is the outcome or what is the goal of this frills buy? So that even when you're pitching a frills buy <laughs> to a CFO, you're teaching or you're talking to them about what the like cultural impact is or what is being what needle is being moved forward that will ultimately, you know, affect revenue for them in a positive manner. Number nine, adjust your buyer personas accordingly. Again, I think that this fits in um, with I think it was point number four on evaluating against the new normal, but reevaluate what your buyer per personas need in this time. So there might be additional personas that you might want to add, and there might be personas that you want to take out. So, I mean, a great example is the CFO needs to be involved in this, but you want to reevaluate re your go-to-market strategy and understand like, hey, this thing was a spoon before, or this thing was a fork before, and I used to use it to eat salads, and now the only thing available is ice cream, and so this is how I would use this, uh, use this fork to eat ice cream, because that's what people are, are doing right now, and this is how my product fits in. So you want to reevaluate, like, are there additional buyer personas that we need to speak with? Are there additional buyer personas that would find value in the new setup? And are there additional are there buyer personas that we should take out from the fold? Because now the one thing that they would have found value in was, you know, again, like increased efficiency with water coolers, you know, within the office. And now all of a sudden they're working remotely. So we need to rethink through what our value prop is and who it speaks to. And then the last one is realizing, yes, realizing that their objections are more real than ever. So I do an objection handling um, course within core session, I think, believe it's three. Uh, no, I believe it's one. I can't remember. Anywho, in core sessions, there's, a, there's objection, a objection handling course. And um, typically with buyers, you know, we are a, we are constantly giving up objections that aren't necessarily the real objection. I'll give you an example. 
I was walking in the other night and I am home for COVID. And I saw someone that I hadn't seen in a long time. And I was talking to him for a couple of minutes, but I really wanted to go in and work and finish one of these sessions. So I said, hey, you know, let's call him Jim. Hey, Jim, uh, it was great seeing you. I actually have to use the restroom. And he called me out. He said, no, you don't. He was like, you just want to go inside. And I'm like, <laughs> I did. <laughs> I really did. I just wanted to go inside and get my work done. So, you know, we are trained from a very early age to not only ask questions that aren't the real questions, but to offer up objections that aren't the real objection because we don't want to make someone feel bad but we also need to get the net net outcome that we want to leave the situation. So normally I would say my meter is up on, is this a real objection or not? You know, a couple of low hanging fruit, the more detail, the le uh, more likelihood it's real. Uh, the uh, better the temperament of the buyer, the more likelihood that it's real. Like if they're, you know, giving you a couple compliments and then giving you the real reality, it's probably real. But you need to understand that when you're selling during COVID, you know, beforehand, no budget meant one thing to sellers. And now if you are an astute seller, you know that it me probably means something completely different. So budget slashes are happening. Budget rollbacks are happening. Layoffs are happening. Consolidation is happening. You know, there are more candidates on the market than ever before. So know that their objections are, have the higher likelihood to be real within those objections, at least. Because during something like a pandemic, you know, people are just slowing their buying down a little bit. So I'm not saying in all cases, I'm not saying that someone doesn't lie that they're going into a meeting whenever they really weren't. And it was 2.37, you know, in the afternoon and they don't have a meeting at 2.38. However, I am saying that more objections typically are more real than ever uh, during a pandemic. Like it's just something to be aware of whenever you're trying to quote unquote counter them. So that is everything. Thanks so much, everybody, for watching. If you like this session, you want to hear more, just go a little bit to your left on the website, and there's a bunch of different topics. If you really love this session, though, do me a favor. Go to Flip the Script on LinkedIn. Give me a tag, your top two takeaways, so I know what you want to hear more of. I want to hear your feedback. But either way, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Watch out.